Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us here. My name's Katie Earl, coordinator of this University Express program, and I work for the Erie County Department of Senior Services. And we're joined here virtually with Bren Price from the Buffalo Presidential Center. Welcome, Bren. Thank you. Thank you for being here. So before we get to his presentation, we have a bunch of new folks on, so I'll quickly go through my housekeeping. We are recording this session and I'll try to post it on our website by the end of the week. You've joined muted and without your video showing and it's not because you've done anything wrong. That's just because those are the settings for our program here today. And as Bren goes through his presentation, feel free to type any questions and comments into your Q&A panel because that's how we'll be communicating with you. If you're new to us, your Q&A panel is likely on the lower right-hand side of your computer screen if you're on a laptop or desktop. Just have to click that to expand it. Or if you're on a smartphone or tablet, poke your screen. That'll bring up your control panel. And then you'll just click on that circle with three dots. There you'll find your Q&A, and then you can type in your questions and comments. So we hope you participate with us. We'd like to thank the sponsors of our program, which is our Department of Senior Services, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Western New York, Excelsior Orthopedics, and Wegmans for all their support. And Senior Services is here for you at 858-8526. Let's learn about the star of our show. Bren T. Price Sr. is a retired school teacher, administrator, and educational consultant who now serves as a trustee of the Buffalo Presidential Center. The Buffalo Presidential Center's mission is to encourage the study of Buffalo and Western New York's contribution to the presidency and national affairs and to share it with the public. I'm sure Bren will tell us more about that. He is also a master docent with Explore Buffalo who loves to tell Buffalo presidential stories during his walking and bus tours. Mr. Price has been collecting political memorabilia for nearly 50 years and has special collecting interests for Buffalo, Re President, Buffalo resident presidents Millard Fillmore and Grover Cleveland. He also collects memorabilia from Abraham Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt, the women's suffrage movement, and Buffalo historical items. Bren, thank you for being here. The virtual floor is yours. Hey, Katie, thanks so much. Uh, I appreciate that introduction. And as and the folks can see on the screen, um, I'm, I'm going to be talking about the, the presidents in Buffalo. And I'm actually right at this moment sitting on the second floor of the Central Library in downtown. And I'm in the Buffalo Presidential Center Museum. That's where I'm speaking from. And you can see behind me, there is one of our many wall boards that has information about presidents in Buffalo. So when I talk about presidents in Buffalo, I also include Niagara County and the uh, Chautauqua Institute because we have had presidents who've, who've been there. So I'm, I want to welcome especially those folks at the Canterbury Center because I have spoken there in the past. You, some of you might remember me, it's been a few years, but a lot has changed since then. We found out a lot more information about presidents who've been in Buffalo, and we now have a Buffalo Presidential Center, if you can make it here. Um, so I'm gonna start off with a question. I, I do, when I do my walking tours, I like to ask a lot of questions. And so the first question is, Joe Biden is our 46th president, right? So do you, anybody wanna make a guess as to how many presidents have been in Buffalo before, during, or after their presidency? Time's up. No, no, really, seriously. Uh, that's what I'm gonna be talking about. And by the time we get to the end, you will understand why I say Buffalo has the richest presidential history of any city in the United States with the exception of Washington, D.C. Believe it or not, uh, that's not my quote, actually. That quote comes from someone else, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. I also want to say that, oh, let me see. Somebody is at the door, and I can't answer. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> um, kind of took me off my train of thought here. Uh, so, uh, I, but I also include uh, Niagara County and Chautauqua Institute as, as part of the visits. I, let's move forward. 
I would like to acknowledge the Buffalo Presidential Center um, and our website at buffalopresidentialcenter.org. That's we telling you a little bit more about that later. I would like to acknowledge Explore Buffalo because I am, as Katie said, a master docent with Explore Buffalo and I do walking tours and bus tours on, on that topic. Uh, also, I'd like to acknowledge the American Political Items Collectors, the APIC. We've got a website there because I've been, as Katie said, collecting political memorabilia for almost 50 years. And in fact, um, everything on this screen right here, if you can see it, all of those things that you see on that screen are items from my collection. But uh, the American Political Items Collectors is designed uh, for people who have an interest in history and collecting presidential and related memorabilia. The other thing I want to say here as kind of an introduction is that this, the information that I'm going to give you is a work in transition. I'm always learning about new visits. And I might have the opportunity to talk about some of the new visits that I've learned in the last, um, even in the last year or two. So it is a work in transition. If you have any questions or any knowledge about something like that, please let me know because some of you have experiences and memories that I don't. And that would be very helpful for me in continuing to improve uh, all the information about presidential visits. So there we go. Um, first, I wanna talk about our resident presidents. You know, there isn't, we're the only city in the United States that can claim two resident presidents. Now, neither one of them were born here in Buffalo, but both of them were residents when they were elected president or when they became president. First of all, we have Millard Fillmore. He was born out in the Finger Lakes in 1800 and uh, served in many capacities, first as a lawyer here in, here in Buffalo, and um, it was actually in 1832, he was actually one of the lawyers who wrote the city charter. And, um, and they became very active in the Whig party early on. And, uh, uh, but he was elected uh, our 13th president and he succeeded Zachary Taylor who died in office. That was, that was the second time in a decade that a vice president took over for a president who died in office, the first being uh, William Henry Harrison in 1840. But Millard, um, he, so he took over from 1850 to 1852, and it was actually a very tumultuous period of time. Um, people think that this, these times are really, uh, are really conflicting. Uh, it wasn't 1850 and probably more so. Uh, he was not reelected in 1852. Um, the Whig Party kind of fell apart, and he was quite unpopular because of some of the stances that he had. Um, and he ran unsuccessfully also in the Third Party, which was known it was the American Party in 1856. It's also known as the Know Nothing Party, and they were nativists. And um, he was not elected, but he got a lot of he got almost a million votes. And he only won the state of Delaware, so he wasn't elected. So he was not ever elected president. He became president, but he was never elected president. Our other resident president, Grover Cleveland. Oh, there's so many stories to tell about Grover. You'd have to go on my walking tour or my bus tour to find out all of those. We just don't have time for it today. But he was our 22nd and our 24th president. The only one to serve two non consecutive terms. And um, even though he won the popular vote all three times in 1888, he did not. Um, he did not win. He lost to Benjamin Harrison. And after he was married, his wife, Frances Folsom Cleveland, told Mrs. Harrison, don't change anything because we'll be back in four years. And sure enough, they were. So Grover Cleveland is Buffalo's other 
resonant presence. Now, we have a lot of other, what I call prominent presidents, and you know, you know these names, they've been around here a lot, and they were, they're well known in presidential communities. Firstly, uh, William McKinley, he was their 25th president. He was actually here on five different occasions. Obviously, most notably the Pan American Exposition in 1901, where he was assassinated. But he's actually here for four or five days in 1897. You know, McKinley was an officer in the Civil War. And so he was a Civil War veteran. They had Civil War veteran uh, reunions all over the country every year. And in 1897, it was in Buffalo. And he came here and he hung around for, for four or five days. I'm sure they got together with the boys and they really hooped it up, even though he was president. He probably behind closed doors was having a pretty good time with his pals. At any rate, so that's William McKinley. And there's there's a really an untold story about William McKinley. Um, you know, some of you may know that when Leon Shogosh, his assassin, first shot him, he was tackled to the ground by an African-American man by the name of James Parker. And James Parker was credited initially, but later on they thought, we can't, we really can't recognize a black man that way. We have to recognize our, our security team. And so um, James Parker was really, after a short period of time was, was forgotten and was not known as the person who, um, who tackled Leon Solgosh to the ground. There's a lot of other uh, untold stories, that being one. Uh, and then of course, after McKinley was assassinated, I think many of you know that Theodore Roosevelt was inaugurated uh, at the Wilcox match on, on September 14th, 1901. What a lot of people don't know is that Theodore Roosevelt came to Buffalo 18 other times, more than any other president. So Theodore Roosevelt was here 19 times altogether. I mean, he was a rookie right out of Harvard the first time he came to Buffalo. He spoke at the Ellicott Club, I believe, and he was just involved. He had just been elected or was in the process of running for the state assembly right out of college. Uh, he was he was a bold individual from the very beginning. But we have other prominent presidents. Uh, no, of course, Abraham Lincoln. Most people do not know that Abraham Lincoln was here in Western New York and Buffalo on four different occasions. He was here in 1848. He was passing through on his way back from uh, his um, term as a congressman. He was going from Washington to Springfield, and he promised Mary, his wife and the family, that they would have a grand excursion. So when he got to Buffalo, he bought tickets on a brand new steamship called the Globe. And they actually did a 10 day excursion on the Great Lakes from Buffalo to Chicago. And then they disembarked and went down to Springfield. You know, people ask me, well, when he was here in 1848, did he, did he actually go to Niagara Falls? And no, he did not. And the reason why he didn't is because he just didn't have enough time. He was here overnight. He just wanted to check out the thriving commercial district at the waterfront because Buffalo at that time was growing and was just, there was a tremendous amount of commerce coming from the West and in, in the form of grains. And there were a lot of people going, uh, going West and grains coming East on the Erie Canal. So, but he didn't have a chance to go to Niagara Falls, but he did in 1857 because he was headed to New York City. And it's a really interesting story because he had represented the Illinois Central Railroad in Illinois as a young attorney and they were being sued by the counties in Illinois for more taxes. Well, Abraham Lincoln defended them and actually won a landmark decision over how to tax 
corporations and particularly railroads, but they wouldn't pay him. They stiffed him. And so he said, I'm going to New York City to see the board of directors there, and I'm going to get my $5,000 fee. But in the meantime, he went through Niagara Falls and Mary came along too when they stopped at the Cataract House, of course, the best place in town. And then they came back on train through Buffalo and down to New York City. Well, when he met with the board of directors of the Illinois Central Railroad, they stiffed him again. They said they weren't going to pay him. Well, Lincoln wasn't a dummy, as you know. He went home and he placed a lien on the Illinois Central Railroad for payment of his services. He said it was a landmark decision. Well, they paid him. Um, and it's a good thing he got paid then because two years later, there was a massive panic and economic depression. And there is no way that he would have been paid that $5,000 two months later after that panic had set in. So imagine that $5,000 was translated today about $140,000 to $150,000. That really set him up for the future in his law practice. He came again in 1861, and uh, he was on his inaugural train. And that inaugural train stopped in uh, 13 cities in 10 days. And he was actually in Buffalo the longest period of time. He, he was here for like 36 hours. And most of the places where he stopped, um, he didn't... Um, uh, uh, he didn't stay very long. It was just kind of passing through. They would uh, they would pick up uh, water and wood because the trains were steam engines, and that's what they needed for fuel. And then again, he came on his funeral train in 1865. Now, what a lot of people don't know is that Buffalo had two funeral events for Abraham Lincoln. Now. He was shot on Good Friday, April 14th. He passes away in the early morning hours on April 15th. They decide in Washington, D.C. that they're going to have the funeral services at the Capitol uh, in Washington on April 19th. And so all over the uh, all over the country, cities like Buffalo were having events. They were having memorial events. And Buffalo had its event on the 19th, and, and there were there were uh, 40 different marching groups and civic groups, and there was a there was a um, a carriage without the body, and it was a, it was a two and a half mile procession. Later that night, um, Miller Fillmore and the local residents found out that the funeral train with the body was actually going to stop in Buffalo on the way back to Springfield, Illinois. So when it stopped here on April 26, nine days later, or eight days later, there was another um, uh, um, funeral procession, and the body ended up in a place uh, off Main Street, now called St. James Hall. Now, if you know where the M&T Plaza is, that's where this St. James Hall was. It was a huge auditorium. They had every they had all kinds of events there. Well, actually. Lincoln's open casket, open casket was in St. James Hall and between 10 a.m. and 8 p.m., somewhere between 80 and 100,000 people went by his body. So do you know that he had an open casket in every city where they stopped? They had three embalmers on the train. Those guys were working their tails off, I guess, trying to keep the body sweet. Can you imagine what that was like? <laughs> At any rate, uh, so that was his uh, his fourth time in president in in uh, in in Buffalo. But we have a lot of early presidents. Our fifth president, James Monroe, was the first sitting president to visit Niagara, Niagara Falls. Uh, excuse me. Fort Niagara and Niagara Falls on August 8th and 9th, 1817, on a tour. Um, there was, he was kind of in the Black Rock area, 
and dressed a Buffalo contingent, complimenting them on their bravery and resilience after the British had burned the city in late December, 1813. Now, interesting, William Henry Harrison was a commander of the Northwest Army who came to Buffalo to uh, address the troops here during the War of 1812. And there was a banquet for him at a place called Pomeroy's Tavern. And two months later is when the British burned Buffalo to the ground. <laughs> and so he actually came to Buffalo 27 years before he was elected president in, 19, in 1840. Now, some of our early other early presidents, because there were many of them who were here, John Quincy Adams visited Buffalo twice after he was president, and he actually went to church services with Millard Fillmore um, in, the, uh, in, in the Unitarian Church at 110 Franklin Street. It's, the structure still stands. And Martin Van Buren, he was a New Yorker, and he was the eighth president, and he was the second one to visit Buffalo while in office in 1839. I'm pretty sure it was a campaign type speech that he gave at the Erie County Courthouse. And he was seeking re-election in 1840. Some more early presidents, John Tyler, he was the first president to advance to the presidency upon the death of William Henry Harrison in 1840. You know, Harrison gave a very lengthy inaugural speech and uh, came down with pneumonia and died. Uh, very shortly thereafter. But John Tyler, as the president, you know, he was one of these vice presidents that wasn't very well respected. And he, so he was quite unpopular, especially with the Whigs. But he did, uh, he did come to Buffalo um, in, after he was president in, um, in 1851. Uh, also, Zachary Taylor, um, Zachary Taylor was Millard Fillmore's president who died in office. We think that he visited the Poinsett Barracks, which is now the site of the Wilcox Mansion, you know, where Theodore Roosevelt was inaugurated. He came there prior to his presidency. Uh, we're not exactly sure we know when. If any of you people were around then, you want to let us know? We, um, we, we could use your help on that one. Uh, okay, I get it. Okay, so, but he did travel here as our 12th president in September of 1849 uh, on a steamer, uh, again, and he visited Black Rock and Niagara Falls. Uh, that would be uh, shortly after uh, Abraham Lincoln had been here. So some of our presidents who came after Lincoln in the post-Civil War were Andrew Johnson. He came here um, after succeeding Abraham Lincoln. He was here just once. He came by rail from Niagara Falls uh, in 1866 as part of a Goodwill tour. Uh, that Goodwill tour was a huge failure. Um, Andrew Johnson was particularly unfavored and he was not popular received here. When he did speak, he was given a very polite response. But when Senator William Seward spoke and when Admiral, uh, or when um, uh, oh, one of the admirals spoke, um, they had huge applauses. And um, so, and actually uh, Ulysses Grant was with him on that tour, um, but he did not speak at, on the podium uh, because he was sick in bed. Um, you know, from, uh, I think they said the night before, in Niagara Falls, he might have had just a little bit too much to drink. And uh, they say he was a bit hungover. So he didn't, he wasn't keen on speaking anyway. But he did come here. He was sent uh, as a general. He was sent here with uh, President Johnson to deal with the Fenian raid uh, in 1866. Uh, and he spoke at Chautauqua Institute in 75 and 80 and 83. Um, so he really did pass through Buffalo in 1880. He was hoping to be uh, come the next third, uh, the next president. Uh, to, uh, he was actually seeking a third term, but that didn't work out so well for him. 
Vertiver B. Hayes, he won the very controversial election in, in uh, 1876. We're not sure, we still haven't found out any information about whether he actually did come through, visit Buffalo. As of right now, we don't think so. James Garfield, on the other hand, was here a couple of times. Um, he spoke at Chautauqua in 1880, and later on, uh, a train excursion uh, brought him to Buffalo, and he was with a couple of his Republican Ohioans, Benjamin Harrison and William McKinley. They were with him on that train, and uh, they stayed overnight at a hotel uh, right about where the Deuville campus is now. That hotel since burned down, so I don't have any more information for you on that. And we've got to move along. So Chester Arthur succeeded James Garfield and served as the 21st president. Um, we do think he came to Buffalo. There, there is, there was a, a, a Lockport connection. Um, he, it, apparently his son was engaged to a woman from Lockport and he may have been there, but I don't have any specific um, backup information on that. If any of you do, please let me know. Uh, Benjamin Harrison, we found out uh, not too long ago, was here in 1880 with Garfield and McKinley campaigning. I mentioned before they stayed out uh, by the Uville campus. Um, it's still in question whether he gave a speech at the fifth annual convention of the National Republican League here. He was very popular in Buffalo at the time. He was supported by the press. Uh, I know for a fact the next day he spoke in Rochester, but I don't have any uh, any clear cut information on whether he he, uh, he was here in Buffalo uh, in 1992 campaigning. So when we when we look at post Civil War and other presidents, what you're going to see is that. James Garfield and every president since or after him visited Buffalo at one time or another. So start counting. The early to mid 20th century presidents, uh, William Howard Taft, you know, he succeeded Theodore Roosevelt. He served as the 27th president. And of course, the Chief Justice of the United States the only person that held both offices. Well, he was here on four different occasions. Um, I have a photograph of him in front of the Wilcox Mansion in 1910. Um, Woodrow Wilson officially campaigned here in Buffalo on Labor Day in 1912 at Bronze Park. I don't know where Bronze Park was. Some of you may. Um, maybe you wanna answer that if you know it in the Q and A. Uh, he also spoke at the Lafayette Hotel, and he was here a few years later uh, speaking at the uh, AFL, American Federation of Labor, on Labor Day, actually, in um, um, at, at a convention in 1917. It's actually Veterans Day, not Labor Day. So uh, we've got some more. Warren Harding, only here twice, only here once, gave a campaign speech here. That was his only visit. Coolidge, only visited Buffalo once as vice president. He gave a speech at the Ellicott Club just a little bit, you know, a little bit before uh, succeeding Harding. Harding was another of our presidents that died in office. And Coolidge became the fourth, fifth, one, two, three, the fifth president or vice president to succeed uh, to ascend to the uh, to the presidency in in 1922. Herbert Hoover was the 35th uh, 31st president. He was here three times, but before he was president, I used to say that he never came here during his presidency, and he never came here after that. But I was giving a program to an antique club in the town of Tonawanda several years back, and I said that Herbert Hoover never came to Buffalo after he was president. And this one lady in the audience said, raised her hand, and she said, oh, yes, he did. I said, please tell. 
She said, my friend here and I were members of the band at Herbert Hoover Middle School in Tonawanda in 1951, and he came to dedicate the school, and we were there. And not only that, they made us dress up in band uniforms, pretend we were band members, because they wanted to make it look like the band was bigger than it was. After all, it's a former president. And you know, how can you deny a story like that? That's so cool to, to hear about that from those ladies firsthand. FDR was in Buffalo at least 15 times, six times campaigning for governor or president. And actually, uh, he was here in, in he was here twice in 1936. Oh, actually, he was here in 32 um, when he dedicated as governor the, uh, the state office building. And then he was here uh, in 1936 where he dedicated the Dillon Federal Courthouse on Niagara Square. You know, uh, it's, it's a marvelous uh, Art Deco facility and uh, unfortunately it was empty for uh, a period of years, but now the police and fire and the uh, and the, the, the city uh, uh, the city folks are have taken that over. Um, he also spoke at Ch Chautauqua. I think there were nine or ten presidents that spoke at Chautauqua over the years. And our early mid twentieth century, Harry Truman was a vice president a seventh vice president to accede to the presidency upon the death of Franklin D. Roosevelt in 45. I've already talked about who the others were. Um, but he spoke in April of 1945, just before, it was a couple of weeks before Franklin Roosevelt died. And I found this out about a month ago. And a lady who was a fellow Explore Buffalo docent said to me, do you know that he was here speaking to a group in 1845, and then he came to my church, my parents, their Baptist church, he came to church services there. And the interesting thing is he wanted a copy of the uh the program for that day the church you know the church program for that day and he signed it and he left them a copy of that sign and he took one home because he wanted to prove to his wife that he went to church on sunday <laughs> and so their church has a record of that and that, that was so cool to find that out he also uh, campaigned here in 48 and he, and he came here on behalf of uh, L.A. Stevenson in, in October of 52. And then he received an honorary doctorate from Canisius in 1962. And so uh, he was, uh, he spent a lot of time in Buffalo. He was a solid Democrat and at that time, you know, Buffalo was. Dwight D. Eisenhower, our 34th president campaigned here and spoke at the odd in 52. I think he came a couple of days after Adlai Stevenson. His opponent in 52 was Adlai Stevenson. And Stevenson spoke at the odd, and I think there were 13,000 people who showed up to see Stevenson. Well, Eisenhower came here a couple of days later, spoke at the odd, and he had like 15,000 people there. So, so he 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 won that one um and but here's the one i found out oh a year or two ago he was a guest here in 1913 on christmas break from uh from west point he was a cadet and one of his cadet buddies was from buffalo and his cadet buddy invited him to come to Buffalo for the Christmas holidays rather than Ike having to go all the way to Kansas. So he stayed with his family. And the reason we found out about it is because the father of this cadet was um, 
the superintendent of the police during the Pan American Expo. And so he was a well-known individual. And in those days, as you recall, they used to have the society pages and they used to write about all of the upper class and what they did that week and who their guests were and so forth. Even when I was growing up, that was a popular column. Um, but that's what we found out about Ike. And there was actually a picture uh, posted of him and his teammate on the West Point football team. So that was kind of cool. Uh, JFK came to Buffalo as a senator in 53, and then again in 59, and he gave Ken a paint speech here at the Odd again on, you know, uh, September 28th in uh, eight, 1960. His, uh, his visit, he came, he came here on Pulaski Day in 1962, that was October 12th or 14th. And he visited, he flew into Niagara Falls, and then he came, he, was, he looked at, you know, the Air Force base there, and then he came down to Buffalo and he spoke at City Hall. There were tens and thousands of people, maybe well over 100,000 people that are packed into Niagara Square. And after he got done speaking with him, with, with uh, two of those people, um, he, one of his aides whispered in his ear, we got a problem in Cuba. And that was the beginning of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so many of you remember that was a very, uh, a very difficult time for uh, a lot of us that lived through that. It was a very scary time. But at any rate, that was, uh, that was Jack Kennedy's uh, last trip to Buffalo. Lyndon Johnson was here. Um, as the 36th president, um, and he campaigned in Buffalo in October of 64, and then he spoke at City Hall again in, in, uh, in, eight, in, in 1966. Um, again, there were just tens of thousands of people lined up in, in Niagara Square. Uh, he would be standing in front of City Hall looking out over the McKinley Monument, and um, that's where many presidential candidates and many presidents spoke. And uh, going, going back to the time of Andrew Johnson um, over the years. So that's, that's been a, that's a very historic site in many ways. Now we move on to Gerald Ford. He was the only appointed vice president. As you recall, when Nixon resigned, um, Ford was, uh, then became as vice president, the, the president. And of course, pardoned Nixon, and that was very, very controversial. And probably that led to the fact that um, he was not elected here in 1976. Jimmy Carter won the state, but he did campaign here late in October in 76. And then he spoke, he had, he had been here prior in 65 at Chautauqua. And then after his presidency in 88, he spoke at UB. So Gerald was here on a couple of occasions. Uh, same Jimmy Carter. He defeated Ford in 76. He campaigned here in 75. Uh, they spoke pre uh, briefly at prior aviation in, in 1978 as president and again spoke at UB. You know, their, their speaker series always seems to have uh, just the best and former president um, uh, Carter spoke there in 89. Uh, and actually, Rosalind came here alone uh, in January of 1880 and uh, spoke to a women's group. Ronald Reagan, our 39th president, campaigned in Buffalo once in 79, twice in 1980, and again at Deuville College in 1984. No other trips are known before or after office, but uh, that's still pretty good. You know, Buffalo was a hotbed. This was. This was back before the really solid red and blue states. And now, you know, you don't see a lot of campaigning by presidents in Buffalo because they think it's not worth their time. It's already being a, a blue state overall. Uh, it's, it's not worth the time and money. So they don't come as frequently as they used to. George H.W. Bush campaigned here in April of 88 he was never here as president, 
but he, he spoke at GCC in Batavia in 1981 and again at UB in 1999. Bill Clinton, our 42nd uh, uh, president, campaigned in Buffalo twice in 92, once in 96, visited here once as president. He was in Buffalo at least eight times before or after office, including uh, he came here uh, to support uh, his wife Hillary in 2016. He also spoke a couple times at Chautauqua. Um, George Bush II spoke here twice, uh, the first at the airport in, in, uh, in 2000, and then at a campaign event at Kleinhans uh, in 2014. He campaigned um, for his father in 1992 um, at both the odd at Loughran's Bar and Restaurant uh, in Snyder. Some of you might have dined there before. Um, it's local. Um, okay. So then we're, we come up to Barack Obama, uh, looking at all those presidents from 1980 to 2021. He was our 44th. He was here on a tour of the industrial support company on D Depot Street in 2010. And some, again, another president who spoke at UB in 2013 and of course it was widely reported where that he stopped at duffs rather than the anchor bar for chicken wings uh, maybe that's because it was close to the airport and the, tra the traffic getting in and out of there was going to be a little bit easy than main and north street uh where where anchor bar is uh, but uh you know the chicken wing aficionados uh they'll have their own uh, they'll they'll have their own story on that and then Donald Trump uh, spoke at a campaign rally here at HSBC as a guest of uh, Bill's football coach, Rex Ryan, in 2016. He made a couple of other appearances here as well. Uh, I know he was interested in buying the, 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 uh, the Buffalo Bills and, you know, he, he traveled about. Uh, but officially as a campaign rally in 2016. And Joe Biden, as a former vice president, he also spoke at the university's Buffalo's uh, Distinguished Speaker Series on October 25th, 2018. Um, and so what we have here is, as of right now, uh, the information that I have right now, 36 of the 46 presidents have been in Buffalo before, during, or after their presidency. And if I count up all those visits, it comes to, I think, 143. That's, that's a Buffalo legacy that most people don't know about. It's really significant. It's really influential in the country. Think about it. Fillmore and Cleveland resident presidents, Lincoln, McKinley, and Roosevelt uh, also spending a lot of time here. The candidacy of Belva Lockwood, who I haven't talked about, but Belva Lockwood was from Niagara County, and she first ran for president against Grover Cleveland in 1884 and 1888. She couldn't vote for herself, but she still did get votes on the Equal Rights Party ballot. Every 20th century president has been here. And when you add First Lady Frances Folsom Cleveland and the two vice presidential candidates, you remember, maybe you remember Jack Kemp, a Buffalo Bill and vice president under Dole, um, and uh, William Miller, who was Barry Goldwater's vice presidential candidate. He was from Lockport. Then add in Shirley Chisholm, who was a hopeful candidate, a legitimate hopeful candidate for president in 1972, a Democratic Party. She was on the ballot in several states. She was the first African-American woman um, to be elected to Congress. She's buried in Forest Lawn Cemetery. So there's, there's that, even though she grew up in, in the Bronx, and uh, serve those people in Congress. Um, she ended up in Buffalo and still with us. 
Forest Lawn Cemetery. So when you put all that together with all the visits, we have an awful lot to brag about. We've got a presidential history that, or a legacy that goes well beyond most cities. In fact, according to Brady Carlson, all cities in the United States, with the exception of Washington, DC. Now this Brady Carlson wrote a book on called Dead Presidents. And as he was researching the dead presidents, where they died and so forth, he spent several days at the Grosvenor Room in the library right here, where I am now, uh, researching dead presidents. And what he and that was his quote that Buffalo has the richest presidential history of any city in the United States, with the exception of Washington, DC. So it's not just me saying this. I mean, this is this is an author. And it's it's so impressive. And and the Buffalo Presidential Center is committed to telling these stories to the people in this community because whether they're young children or seniors like me, we should know this um, and we should spread the word. And we're very much hoping that uh, anyone who hears this message will come to visit the Buffalo Presidential Center on the second floor of the library. And um, with, with that, I don't know how we're doing on time. We may be a, we may be a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, but I want to I want to see if if you have any questions. I have a feeling you will. And uh, I'll I'll let your questions guide us for the rest of the time, Katie. Thank you, Bren. We do have some questions and comments here, but I'd like to thank you first for giving us all of the information. It's very impressive how you keep it all straight, in my opinion. <laughs> um, but before I jump into those, for people to visit the Presidential Center, what are the hours and do they have to make an appointment right now or can they just pop in? Right now, we're only open on Saturdays. Of course, there's free parking on Saturdays downtown. So that's not a problem. We're open on Saturdays from 10 until 4. Um, but I just had some friends from Albany stop by earlier today. And so if there are groups or if there um, are people who want to make a special appointment, I would be glad to uh, try to accommodate them. If not me personally, then another member of the uh, Board of Trustees of the Buffalo Presidential Center. Okay, thank you, Bren. Thank you for that offer. Um, so we'll start with the comments I'm seeing first. I have, I had no idea about all of these stories. We have, I love your humor, which I second <laughs> that. <laughs> well, I've got a lot more stories and a lot more humor. You just, you've got to, you know, you got to, Come down to the presidential center or go on my tour because some of the stories really are pretty funny. I'm sure. We have somebody's wondering, do you know where the presidents would stay when they visit? Was it all at the same place? Did they like to do the same things? They over time they stayed at different places. Um uh I mentioned the Pomeroy Hotel. Um I, they, they stayed, Lincoln stayed at the American House Hotel, which is no longer there. That was rebuilt twice and AM and A's was there for a while. And that's now where Main Place Mall is. Um, they stayed at the Statler Hotel, uh, the, the former Statler Hotel, uh, which was near the ballpark, the baseball park. What are they calling it today? It's not Salem's anymore. It's what is it? I forget. At any rate, um, and also they've stayed at uh, the, the the Statler Towers. Um, trying to think, there wasn't, there hasn't been a particular place that they would stay uh, because 
you know that it would be a bigger place like the Statler Towers, and I can't think of where other presidents had stayed when they visited. They might have come and gone that night because the security issue is big. And it takes so much time and effort to secure a hotel space. I'm sure. Thanks for that, Bren. The next question is, would first ladies usually come with? Uh, not always, but I, I would, I would say at least half the time first ladies would come, especially if they weren't campaigning. A lot of times first ladies uh, did not go on the campaign trail uh, and or modern first ladies uh, tended to be someplace different at the same time. So for the campaigning, but many of the early presidential first ladies did not travel with their presidents uh, as much as they, even as they do today, I think. Hey, thank you. Good the questions. One, yeah, aren't they though? We've got a really engaged yeah. group. Oh yeah, I've been to that Canterbury place before and, 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 and those <laughs> folks, they study their history. They know it. <laughs> they do. I don't know if any of them remember me, but I remember them. <laughs> <laughs> the next one is, you said there are a lot of Grover Cleveland stories. Which one is your favorite one to tell? Oh, how about the baby Ruth story? Now, President and Mrs. Cleveland had five children. The first three were girls and the second two were boys. And the firstborn, its name was Ruth. And so she became popularly known as Baby Ruth because Francis Folsom Cleveland being very young and vibrant and intelligent and beautiful was like the Jackie Kennedy or the Princess Diana of the day. And so when she gave birth to her first child, um, they weren't even, they were, that's, Ruth was born in, in 1891. So that was when he was kind of in between uh, his terms. But baby Ruth was, was this huge personality of her own. And People were fascinated with it. Well, in 1920, the Curtis Candy Company came out with a candy bar by the name of the Baby Ruth candy bar. And Babe Ruth, the ball player, was wanting to get some royalties on, on that because he thought that they had named the candy bar after him. And the Curtis Candy Company said, oh, no, we named that candy bar after Baby Ruth Cleveland. So there, well, that was a little shaky because Baby Ruth Cleveland died in, in 1905, she, 1902 or three, she was only like 11 years old. So how did they calculate that they should name that candy bar after a deceased child. Um, so that's that's really kind of an interesting and funny story. And it's still it's still proliferating today. And if you talk to George Cleveland, who was actually Grover and Grover and Francis Cleveland's grandson, actual grandson living today, if you talk to him, he swears by that story that baby Ruth was named after his great aunt, I guess, um, baby Ruth Cleveland. But um, I have to lean towards uh, the Curtis Candy Company trying to uh, cut Babe Ruth out of some extra royalties. <laughs> so how's that for a story? Did I do okay with that one? I think you see. did great. <laughs> Let me see. Oh, there are others. I'm sure, Brent. We have um, a couple comments that came through. 
I'm seeing, thank you so much. Really enjoyed your presentation. Learned so much. Looking forward to your walking tours. And then we have, I got to meet Shirley Chisholm at Melody Fair during intermission. She was so happy I introduced myself. Didn't President Kennedy stop in Lockport? Thank you for all the info. We enjoyed your humor. Can I ask that person, uh, what does she, does she know the date or the, the, the day that she met Shirley Chisholm? And where was that again? At Melody Fair in Tonawanda? Uh, Mel it just says Melody Fair. I'm not sure where, but. I, I know um, it's in, it was in Tonawanda. She okay. met Shirley Chisholm there. Mm -hmm. And when, when was that? Maybe she'll type that back in. Maybe she will. I'll let you know if it comes through. Okay. Uh, then the second part of that was, didn't President Kennedy stop in Lockport? Question mark. He may have stopped in Lockport. Um, I don't have specific information on that unless it was part of his 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 one of his other trips. Uh, I had heard tell that he was in Hamburg and in other places. And if that person could type in any information that they have about a Lockport visit, I would appreciate it very much. This is what I mean about um, it's still a work in progress in terms of all the visitations. Definitely. And I thank you so much for the feedback. I'll let you know if anything comes through and I can also connect with them offline to see if they want to chat with you and give any information that they may have. Okay. Um, the last thing I'm seeing in addition to some thank yous is where do you do most of your research? Uh, I've done a lot of my research has been in the Grosvenor room in uh in the library here in, in 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 here in the library that's the research area of the library i've done a lot of research there i have um i have a lot of collector friends with a great deal of knowledge uh of course uh reading books and journals and magazines uh you know particularly presidential biographies um I have a, a, a great friend uh, who wrote a book. <clears throat> Ooh. Who wrote a book, if you can see this, called Buffalo and its President. This was heavily researched uh, by Martin Nowak, who used to live in Buffalo. And I, I actually met him in the Grosvenor room in the library. And he heard me talking about it and corrected me on several occasions and uh he was he's a great resource and friend and that's a wonderful book to read that that book right there i can get you a copy because uh he's left some with us here in the buffalo presidential center which i'm we're we're selling as kind of a fundraiser for for 20 bucks each great thanks brent next i'm seeing great presentation and then somebody's wondering when and how do you sign up for your tours? Uh, the tours need to sign up uh, through explorebuffalo.org. If you if you go there and you can sign up, I um, I typically do about three or four tours a month, uh, either on a Saturday or on a Monday. And when you're signing up. You might want to ask if I'm giving the tour, but there are other people who give the tour who are also knowledgeable. Um, and, and everybody who gives the tours got a little different perspective on things. They might add more in terms of uh, the art and architecture of the city. Um, they, they might have different stories to tell. So. Uh, that go to explorebuffalo.org. Uh, that's the starting point. And then tell them you saw me and you want to take my tour. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. I will give a plug for Courtney Speckman, also from the Buffalo Presidential Center. She will be back with us on June 22nd at 2 p.m. for Inside the White House. Oh, that'll be a good one. Mm-hmm. She worked, she worked in the White House historical uh, 
Association for 10 years. And boy, does she have some stories. So you want to check out Courtney. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. And so that's June 22nd at 2 p.m. And Brent, I'm just seeing a bunch of thank yous here. So thank you for your time today. Thank you for sharing all of this knowledge with us. And to everyone who's on, enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you, too. Okay, very good.